By texting 484848, you agree to receive recurring automated marketing messages from Babbel. Message and data rates may apply. No purchase required. Terms apply. Available at babbel.com slash TNC. We're planning a trip to Spain later this year. But our Spanish is... It's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> when you learn a language, you want to actually use it. Babbel is designed with that goal in mind. Babbel's conversation-based method teaches you real-life words and phrases. And with Babbel's interactive bite-sized lessons, you'll remember what you learned. ¿Cómo te llamas? ¿Cómo te llamas? ¿De dónde eres? ¿De dónde eres? No matter your learning style or experience level, Babbel has lessons designed for you that will get you speaking quickly and confidently. I tried learning Spanish before, but I couldn't stick with it until I found Babbel. There's no easier way to learn another language. Ahora hablamos español. He just said, now we speak Spanish. I can't wait to use our new language skills on our upcoming adventures. Babbel, language for life. Celebrating 10 million subscriptions sold. Now try Babbel for free. Just text TRY to 484848 to start learning a new language today. That's TRY to 484848. T-R-Y to 484848. The following is a Hoop Bowl presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. promised you guys I'd get Friday's pod out a little bit earlier, and I'm figuring this out. Recording by lunchtime now. What did I say on yesterday's show? Skip lunch, the hell with it. Who needs it? I do, actually, desperately. I have the metabolism of a 12-year-old. The digestive system of a 92-year-old and the metabolism of a 12-year-old. It's a very weird combination. No idea why anyone would choose to live with me. Somebody did. She's an idiot. Someone's going to tell her that I talked about my wife on today's podcast. She's going to be like, oh, what did he say? Oh, he called you an idiot for living with him. Uh, anyway, welcome to Fantasy NBA Today, everybody. I am your host, Dan Bespris. This is your Friday edition, show 22 in our 31 shows and 31 days extravaganza here in the month of October. The NBA season now kind of in full swing. We had our first TNT Thursday. Here I am over here just flailing between baseball playoffs and basketball. And luckily, the first two games yesterday were dog do, and then the last game was great, and I got to switch over to the last game when the baseball game ended. It was beautiful. There are certain times that the lords of sports above us, the deities who control all the things that happen in sports in our world, they come together and they're like, let's make sure Dan can actually see the things he needs to see. Let's make the basketball games that are happening when his favorite baseball team is playing, let's make them super uninteresting and really hard to glean information from. And let's make the one that still has like a half to play even after Dan's game is done, let's make that one the one that, that people need to pay attention to. You guys know the drill at this point, I think. We're two days in, so that's a lot of days. We're going to cover NBA news right at the outset here. We will discuss yesterday's three-game card, and we'll get you set. Normally, by the way, I know you guys hate when I do, like, administrative stuff at the beginning of the podcast, but it's actually kind of important today also, just because we are settling into the swing of things. This 31 shows and 31 days thing, every single show here now that the season started is going to have this generally the same format. We're going to cover the night before. We're going to cover the upcoming slate. Because we're doing shows every single day, we can afford to do it like that. I've done a lot of the other things that I want to do on social media this week. For instance, a couple days ago, I had a Rate My Team thread. You guys were able to write in with your actual team, and I told you what I thought you got right and wrong on draft day. Yesterday, I just did a tell me a player you want me to break down game, and like 75 of you sent me players. That was a lot of typing. It was a lot of tweeting for these little fingers. Uh, today, I think I'm going to do a thread on early season trades. So if you have a fantasy trade going on, or you got something proposed to you, or you're thinking about proposing something, I'm going to open up a thread where you guys can hit me with those. And it's not a grade, really. I'm just going to tell you which side I like and why, for the most part. So I think we'll do that on Twitter today. So we'll, because we're doing these shows, 31 shows in 31 days, and because there's always games then to cover, I... I'm taking sort of the extra stuff and moving it into social media for now. Once we get into November and I'm no longer doing a show every single godforsaken day, (laughs) 
uh, which is already starting to sound like a really nice break from my voice. Then on Monday, you guys might remember Mondays are generally reverse chronological lightning round Mondays where we cover the whole weekend that just happened working backwards through it. Friday's shows are generally with Brewski where we talk about the biggest stories of the week. And then, and we're still going to do the little bit of this, but you know, we'll talk to Adam King intermittently, probably on uh, either Tuesdays or Wednesday shows. You'll get to hear from Adam. We're going to take some big questions from the community. So that'll be something that slips in. I'd like to do some more shows with Brandon Marcus. He always had a really nice buy low, sell high segment. That type of stuff we can bring back to the podcast a bit more once we do have sort of more to jam into these episodes. But right now, this is such a critical time where we're just figuring out what every team is actually going to do with their roster that we want to spend our time hitting those things. So let's do that right now. We'll start with the news of the day. The in generally it's injury news of the day. And this morning we found out that Bradley Beal's hip groin thing is trending towards being out tonight, which is super annoying because I randomized into the 11 and 12 slot in almost every single damn cash draft I did. And I ended up with a whole lot of Bradley Beal because, well, uh, people were afraid that he was going to miss games for COVID protocol. And I was like, nah, but here he is missing a game with, Frickin' hip groin stuff. And then there's this whole, like, well, what if they're terrible? They won their opener. So things actually looked pretty good for one day, but perhaps that's why Beal didn't have 35 points. He's going to be relied upon a lot because they're not going to be able to just shut down a very rusty and confused Raptors team every ball game. So I expect Beal to be all right. The fact that the report is, like, it actually used the words trending toward, and I've seen that in a number of different tweets about it, that's basically like, look, he's not that hurt, but we got a long haul ahead of us here, so whatever. Still just annoying more than anything else. We also find out that Cade Cunningham is out for the Pistons' upcoming three-game road trip, so there was fleeting hope, I think, that he was only going to miss the first game of the year. He's actually going to miss a few more. And that's the only real bits of news at the start of this one. Let's go back. And let's talk a little bit about what happens last night on Thursday. It was a three-game card, and uh, four of the six teams, the last four teams, were playing their first game of the year. The Mavericks, the Hawks, the Heat, and the Clippers hadn't played yet. And in kind of a weird twist, um, the teams that hadn't played yet generally looked pretty good last night. It usually trends the other way. You usually get a really rusty first game of the year. But that was really only the case for uh, Dallas. I, Atlanta, Miami, and the Clippers all actually played, I thought, relatively well. Not that the Clippers shot the lights out or anything, just 44%. But, like, Paul George was on his game. There were individual players who looked rusty. Reggie Jackson looked rusty as hell. For the Heat, Kyle Lowry looked very rusty. Duncan Robinson looked pretty rusty. The entire Mavericks team looked bad. Like, bad, bad, other than Jalen Brunson. And for the Hawks, almost everybody looked pretty good. Trey Young, I think you could argue, was also a little bit rusty. 14 assists will make you forget about the other rust pretty quickly. Five turnovers. Anyway, let's break the games down a little bit, because, I, I again, I was surprised at how well three of the four teams had played. I guess they just... You know, when you're not on opening night, you can knock the jitters off some other way. Dallas looked terrible. Atlanta looked good. That was kind of the the storyline from this one. Hawks just beat the pants off of them. Um, 26-point victory here. Getting my numbers right on that one. Luka, extremely rusty. Did make his free throws, though, so that was something. If you want to take a silver lining away from that ballgame. What we were looking for on this Mavericks game... Did we even do a look ahead on yesterday's podcast? I might have forgotten. No, I think I said just pay attention to the Clippers. What we were looking for on this Maverick side was, will anyone besides Luka and Kristaps Porzingis, number one, play enough to have fantasy value? And more importantly, will they have enough usage for fantasy value? And on night number one, the answer was no. This could change when their offense gets clicking because we know that between well really Luca alone can turn a team into an all-world offense but he was very bad you could say Atlanta's defense was good it was but no one can do that to Luca by themselves no defense does that that's heavily just 
Luka being off on a given night. The contenders on the Mavericks to be those other dudes, and look, like Kristaps is going to be better than this. The fact that he only had five rebounds was a bit out of character, but he got his blocks. He'll make his threes. More often than not, he'll take more shots than Jalen Brunson in a ball game. Tim Hardaway Jr., this is the guy that I think everybody was like, look, I could take him late in drafts. He's the, he'll hover between 90 and 120 pretty much all season long. Is there any upside there as sort of the other offensive option? And on night number one, the answer looked like a a pretty resounding no. He only took nine shots. His usage was just 17.8 in this ball game, which we needed more of that. And he kind of got outplayed by Jalen Brunson. Jalen Brunson is another interesting little case study because he's coming off the bench, and if he's not hot, then he probably sees his minutes trickle off a little bit. He played 26 in this one, had 17 points in a nice ball game, but he doesn't pass very much. He doesn't rebound at all. His defensive stats are extraordinarily low. What he does do, by the way, he doesn't hit that many threes usually. He had three in this ball game, so maybe he's working on his range, but he's usually kind of a high percentage two point scoring guard. It's a very weird combination. And it doesn't really work in nine category leagues or eight category leagues. Really, I should have just said category leagues. But it does work okay in points formats. I'm not adding him anywhere after that ballgame. The guy I do have my eye on is Dorian Finney-Smith, who was always marginalized a bit by the roster around him. And that probably happens again. But for stretches last year, he was actually pretty close to having fantasy value. I think there were like two months where he was hovering right around the edge of the top 90. So far this year, he's number 179. He wasn't added in many places. He was drafted in deeper leagues. But what I liked about that ball game is that he took 12 shots. And I don't know that that's something that's necessarily a repeatable phenomenon for him, but he only took eight last year. In 32 minutes of ballgame. Last season scored a career high 9.8 points per game. Made a career high two three-pointers per game. Was just a shade off his rebounding high. Came down from 5.7 to 5.4. Steals were tied for a career high at .9. Blocks were basically right on his career average of .4. Dorian Finney-Smith is one of the least exciting players that's probably sitting on your waiver wire. There's no way to sugarcoat that. And you're never going to look at his game and say, ooh. But at the same time, he was legitimately last year like one shot per game away from being a nine-category standard league guy. So if we think he can go from 7.8 to 8.8 shots per ball game then he belongs on fantasy teams as a guy to kind of round things out. You're never going to pick him up in a head-to-head league because even with the inside the top 100 thing, his value is floated by very low turnovers. But you get a guy who just doesn't hurt you anywhere. And, I mean, I guess if there's durability in head-to-head, that's something to look at. Roto-wise, he kind of rounds out the team a little bit. Going to lose you a little bit in points, but he's okay in threes. He's okay in rebounds. He's okay in steals. Percentages aren't going to hurt you. He's a compiler. So keep an eye on DFS. Not the game. I'm terrible at that. The player, Dorian Finney-Smith. Because I do think the 12 shots thing is... It's notable in its very small sample size. Thing to think about last year is he actually did take 11 shots in his season opener. I was uh, in Phoenix. Dallas opened up in Phoenix. He went for 11 and 8, three assists, two steals. He made four instead of two shots last year. The thing we want to watch with, with Finney Smith is that he didn't hit double digits and shots again until January 7th. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven games later. Really, like one out of every two weeks, he hit double digit shots. And then he went a stretch between February 22nd, right around the All Star break last year, and April 5th, where he didn't take double digit shots. I also would like to remind you guys, he was among the Mavericks who was marooned in Denver for three weeks in the middle of January with COVID. It's very conceivable he didn't really get his wind back until mid-March. 
That's what we heard from a number of these guys, that they just didn't have their win. He was pretty good, actually, in March and April of last year. So don't write him off just because he's extraordinarily boring. I know that's a, a, a reason to write off guys in fantasy quite a bit. Um, but there's, there's a little bit of something there with him. And uh, he also has power forward eligibility, which for teams that go guard heavy is somewhat useful. Just keep him on the radar. And he's not like a must-add or anything. And I just figured we could spend some time on it because there are only three games to go over. On the Atlanta side, the thing we were paying attention to was how do the minutes get distributed among the 15 wings that they want to get into the lineup? I exaggerate, of course, but they have DeAndre Hunter, Cam Reddish, Bogdan Bogdanovich, Kevin Herter. You could even argue Solomon Hill is on the outskirts of that discussion. DeLon Wright, who's basically the backup point guard on that team, but kind of plays more like a wing anyway, or distributing large guard. John Collins... All set. Clint Capella, minutes restriction, but generally he's all set. Gorgie Jang, going to be a terrific fill-in center anytime you hear Capella's missing a ball game. So if you can get out in front of that one, Capella turns an ankle or has a sore Achilles or something, just roll up into Gorgie Jang and enjoy it. Trey Young, of course, he's your point guard. Everything else after day one is a little bit confusing. Now, the fact that this was a blowout meant that the main guys didn't need to get back in the ballgame. I'm inclined to believe that the starters minutes on that team are going to go to Hunter and Bogdanovich. That's the way it looked. They started the game and they also played significantly more than Cam Reddish, who was hot as hell coming off the bench, but still only saw 21 minutes. Herter only played 22. By the way, no Danilo Gallinari for this one, so that only complicates matters a little bit more. Does... Where do these guys belong in terms of fantasy? I mean, we're one game in. So at this point, all you need to worry about is that Hunter and Bogdan are your guys. And I don't think anybody else on that team, outside of the really obvious ones, excluding the top 50 trio, nobody else to me needs to be rostered. I don't think you need to have Cam Reddish on your team. I don't think you need to have Kevin Herter, Gallo, no, whatever. Like all of those guys, they can be cast aside. I think you roll with Hunter, you roll with Bogdan, and you probably start those guys and just sort of see how it goes, because if this was more competitive, they probably would have been able to do a tiny bit more down the stretch. Game two, Milwaukee was without Brook Lopez, uh, without Drew Holiday, and they just sort of mailed this one in. Got their ring ceremony, beat the clothes off of Brooklyn, and uh, then had a party in Miami. Oops. So, what do we do? with Milwaukee. Uh, The hope, I think, is that Drew Holiday will be back very soon, and Brook Lopez also, hopefully, will be back very soon. If they're not, you're in a little bit of a bind. They started George Hill yesterday, Pat Connaughton, I think technically was the starting power forward with Giannis, probably the starting center. That's a weird lineup. I do like Grayson Allen still. I know it wasn't like, this wasn't the game to say this is the reason we like him, but considering how bad this went for the Heat, losing by 42 points for the uh, Bucks, excuse me, the fact that Allen still had 14-3 and with a couple of three balls on only 11 shots, he was basically their best player yesterday. So yeah, I'll roll with Grayson Allen. I know that he's going to disappear when Dante DiVincenzo comes back, who just sort of slides in and becomes a better version of Grayson Allen, but he's not back yet. So take what we can get. Otherwise, don't do anything crazy with Milwaukee. Things are going to equilibrate a little bit. On the Miami side, everyone's going to be talking about Tyler Hero, but he did only play 24 minutes. And I know maybe some of that was blowout, but I don't think it was. I think if anything, his numbers were inflated by the blowout scenario. He's not going to hit 10 for 18 shots most games. As a field goal percent guy, he's on the lower side. His free throw percent is only fine for the most part. He doesn't get defensive stats. It's a tough road to hoe to category league value on Hero. Points league value? Yeah, absolutely. Because then you wipe out the field goal percent. The lack of steals and blocks is less of an issue because he could just roll it up by getting a few more points. Hero, points league, category league? No, I'm not a buyer on that. I don't believe this is a legitimate thing. Bam Adebayo, 20 and 13. Only one assist for Bam. And there is a bit of a fear that with Kyle Lowry in town, they won't need to run as much through Adebayo. 
but I'm not all that concerned about it. He missed a bunch of free throws. Otherwise, we would have been talking about what a really nice game he had in only 23 minutes before the blowout said, bam, you can rest. 20 points and 13 rebounds in 23 minutes is pretty freaking good. We're splitting hairs there. Uh, Lowry looked bad with his new team. Rolled an ankle, came back. We'll see if that has any impact on anything. He was a guy that I think many of you would have expected would appear on Dan Vesper's list, but he actually, to me, is maybe on the wrong side of old. Like, you hit a point where you're now so old that your name is enough to keep you on the draft board. For a while, guys are just a little bit old, and they're doing really nice things, but they're not shiny anymore. And at some point, they become a little too old, but they still get drafted in that same, which was for a long time, low spot, even though they've now sort of moved past that downward in what they're doing. In any event, I'm not a big Kyle Lowry guy this year. He'll be better than this, for sure. And if anybody's panicking, you can go flip a top 100 dude their way and see what happens. That, by the way, doesn't mean someone who's averaging something in the top 100. I'm talking about someone you drafted near 100 who's overperforming and you don't think it's going to stick. Jimmy Butler was great, 21-4-6, and 6, 6 out of 10 shooting, 9 for 11 free throws. He did his thing. Played 29 minutes for whatever reason. I don't fully understand that. And then P.J. Tucker was oddly decent in this ballgame. I'm not about to go bite on that, but we'll watch it just in case. Doubtful it materializes in anything. And then Duncan Robinson, 8.6 boards. We've been classifying him as more of a streamer-level guy. Probably does end up as a decent head-to-head play this season because if he's healthy and he just sort of rolls up value all season long, again, taking someone who's just not getting you zeros does have... Uh, By texting 64,000, you agree to receive recurring automated marketing messages from Babbel. Message and data rates may apply. No purchase required. Terms apply. Available at babbel.com slash TNC. Have you tried learning a new language, but it never seems to stick? That's because there's more to language than learning vocab words. Babbel is different. Babbel's multiple ways to learn helps you explore every aspect of a new language. Anytime. Right from your phone or computer. Practice real-life conversations in the Babbel app. ¿Cómo te llamas? ¿Cómo te llamas? Get personalized help from an instructor in Babbel's live online classes. Classes are limited to six people. We keep them small so everyone can get the help they need. Review words and phrases with fun games. Or dive into the culture with short videos. Whatever your learning motivation, Babbel gives you the tools you'll need to explore your new language. With Babbel, you can speak a new language. Babbel. Language for life. Celebrating 10 million subscriptions sold. Now try Babbel for free. Just text TRY to 64000 to start learning a new language today. That's TRY to 64000. T-R-Y to 64000. Usefulness on a week-to-week basis. But yeah, not a whole lot to take away from that Heat game. And then the Warriors and the Clippers. This one was uh, easily the most interesting game from both fantasy and reality perspective. Steph went nuts 45-10 45 and 10 with eight three pointers. I mean, he's 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 something else. Triple doubled in his first game. He's somehow only he's ranked 10th on a per game basis, mostly because Jalen Brown got to play an extra 10 minutes of basketball. Evan Fournier, Robert Williams, the, the a, mon, a number of names in the top 10 are guys who got to play uh, 10 extra minutes in the one game they got. Uh, also in there, by the way, Cat Lamelo. Zach Levine had a really good first game. C.J. McCollum, Jared Allen, who went 11 for 11, and Harrison Barnes. What? In any case, Steph's going to be wonderful. If you got a pick in the top three and you ended up with Steph, you're going to be a very happy person. Andrew Wiggins, minutes cap, slowly moving up. Got up to 31 minutes in this one. Looked pretty good. I do think he's going to end up being a, a pretty solid fantasy play this year just based on where he was getting drafted near 90 but not going to blow anybody away. Draymond went two for nine at the free throw line. What the hell happened there? I mean, normally he's like seven for nine, and then we're talking about 15, six, and seven with a steal. That would have been a really good game for him. Oh, well. We'll, We won't even remember this one in two months, but it's annoying now. Uh, Jordan Poole, who we've talked about quite a bit on this podcast, someone who relies very heavily on making buckets didn't make them in this game and had seven turnovers not good and that i mean that not that that's really the rub with pool the rub with pool is that clay thompson's going to come back and turn him into a pumpkin at some point but the other part is he really is better built for points leagues do i think he'll be a nine cat useful player while clay's out yeah 
but it's not going to be this like people were people were coming at me on Twitter with pool top 50 upside I'm like ah let's let's dial it back a little here look at the guys that were in the top 50 last year and tell me if you think Jordan Poole has that type of fantasy game no I mean he's he's probably going to be in the 75 to 100 range while Clay Thompson's out and that's fine but people started to draft him in that 75 to 100 range and then it's not fun anymore because the value got wiped away that's okay we tried to predict Nemanja Bjelica's line in this ball game. I said nine and six. He had six and six. We were close. We were close. He played 16 minutes. We also said that Bjelica would be both the most picked up and dropped player in the first week of fantasy basketball. And I think we're in pretty good shape on that prediction so far because he's just not that good. And if he's not playing great, he's going to lose playing time to somebody else who's playing better, like someone who can play defense. And so they went heavier on Iguodala in yesterday's ballgame. They went heavier on Damian Lee in yesterday's ballgame. That's going to happen. And then when Wiggins' minutes limit gets lifted and Draymond's minutes cap gets lifted and James Wiseman shows up, then as we said, it's not a great look. The Warriors' media machine has done an unbelievable job of making us all believe that Bielitsa, EuroLeague MVP, is going to win them games this year. He's not. He's going to be a perfectly fine backup player. And that's pretty good compared to the 99.999% of all of us who suck at basketball compared to all of these guys. But compared to the other these guys, Bielitsa is a good backup. That's his role. The more interesting fantasy stuff, since people I'm sure are dropping Bielitsa as we speak came from the Clippers side, where we got all kinds of lovely information. Information piece number one, Paul George is going to have to do a lot this year. We knew that. Information piece number two, Reggie Jackson, starting point guard, played 39 minutes, was miserable at shooting the basketball, but everything else screamed sweet. I know it's really weird for me to look at a game where a guy shot five for 19 from the field and say, sweet. But if he's out there taking 15 to 20 shots a ball game this year, and maybe they don't all go at this kind of pace. I don't know. A lot of NBA games do go at this kind of pace these days. Maybe they don't all go this fast, but Reggie's going to just walk into assists because he's a starting point guard of an NBA team. He's not going to rebound very much, but also Clippers, when they go small as a team, won't rebound very much. So some of the long ones are going to bounce to Reggie, probably more than he had in other scenarios. Playing 39 minutes means he probably will get about one steal a ball game, which is a problem because that's not, well, generally, I should say that's a problem for him because usually steals and blocks are one of the things where you're like, yeah, he doesn't do these at all. That makes it harder for him to hit category league value. But this is, I mean, we really could be looking at Reggie's biggest minute per game season since Detroit went and got him from Oklahoma City. Remember OKC, he played sparingly his first couple of years. This is actually important. We need to go through the Reggie Jackson career arc. His last season in OKC, he played 28 and a half minutes a game, didn't really have much of a, much leeway. They still had some superstars then, as you might recall. And a bunch of them. That was 2013, by the way. It's a long time ago now. Average 13, 4, and 4 with 1.1 steals that year. Detroit said, hmm, okay, see, not going to play this dude. We're going to go get him. They did partway through the 2014-15 season. And they said, do whatever the hell you want, Reggie. And he took 15 and a half shots per game the rest of that year. Played 32 minutes, averaged 18 and 9 with .7 steals, only one three-pointer. And one of his worst free throw shooting seasons of his career, oddly enough. Next season in Detroit, they gave him the the, uh, keys to the car again. 2015 played 31 minutes a game, averaged 19 and 6. Only .7 steals that year. Which again, that's what we've talked about with him. That's not a strong area. Next year he got hurt, played 52 games. Never really quite got his minutes where he wanted them. Year after that, he was hurt again. Never really quite got his minutes where he wanted them. And... uh, 2018, he was healthy again 
with the Pistons. Averaged 15.5, four assists, because they were actually running a lot of their offense through Blake at that point, Blake Griffin, uh, and .7 steals in 28 minutes of ball game. So really, since that first year, year and a half in Detroit, Reggie hasn't been asked to be a 30-minute-a-game starter. If that's what's about to happen with the Clippers this year, and it seems like it might be, just based on they don't have a whole lot of offense around Paul George. They've got some. They've got shooters, but they don't have many creators on that team. They might ask Reggie to go be a creator. Go get six-plus assists per game. Go get... I mean, I don't think he's going to get more than three and a half, four rebounds a night. Uh, just play enough to get .8, .9 steals instead of .6 or .7. He takes way more three-pointers now than he used to. Two, he could end up with two and a half a game this year. I would hope that the field goal percent is not 21. Also, he's a brilliant free throw shooter. 86% in his career. So expect two to two and change of those most ball games. So I thought that was actually a really refreshing first game for Reggie Jackson, despite the fact that he shot the ball horribly. He's very much an all systems go guy for me going forward based on what we saw in this one. Marcus Morris played 25 minutes as the starting power forward. Uh, that, to me, doesn't augur all that well. I know he, he's he's sort of on and off injured stuff. He needs, we've talked about it before, about 13 shots a game to hit fantasy value. So unless you're in it kind of a punt, all big man type of stats situation, he's useless to you. Eric Bledsoe and Terrence Mann were the other interesting names on the Clippers. Bledsoe started at shooting guard, played 30 minutes, which was interesting because he only played 12 in the first half. I didn't notice if he was in foul trouble at halftime. I thought he only had two, but maybe the page I was looking at hadn't refreshed properly. But he ended up playing 18, 17, uh, 17 and a half second half minutes and finished with 22, 3 and 2, 3 steals a block and a 3-pointer. He's a guy you need to add everywhere because historically he's had a great steal rate that kind of came off towards the end in Milwaukee, and then last year in New Orleans, you could tell he was just going through the motions. That team was bad. Stan Van Gundy had kind of lost the locker room anyway. Just a weird blend of mismatched pieces, but I think he's excited. This is a team, Clippers, when got him, he's played with them before. There's a comfort level. This is going to be a team that grinds every night, uh, and I think he's ready for that. So I say pick up Bledsoe. It, they're not all going to be this good. He's not going to shoot 63%, but 16 shots is way more than enough, and I do think that he probably bungles his way into more than two assists in most ball games. And then Terrence Mann is also very much a guy you need to add. He came off the bench and played almost 40 minutes in this ball game, so it seems like he's going to get a ton of playing time. The issue with Mann is that his usage was 8 like, he could not buy touching the basketball in this ball game, But he's going to play enough where he'll just get a couple of open looks. He'll get some rebounds. He'll get some assists. He'll get some steals. He'll probably end up with half a block. Basically, anybody playing 39 minutes is going to get fantasy value. It's not going to be that high every night. This was a closely contested game. You should be saving for the future. But savings accounts suck. And investing can be scary. We combine the ease of savings with the real returns of investing. We call it Save Vesting, and it's only available in our new app, Stairs. Stairs offers 4 to 6% returns, no fees, and you can withdraw anytime. Do your future a favor. Visit stairsapp.com today. The Clippers went to their the guys they trusted for a few extra minutes. They'll have games where they don't. Uh, but man also belongs on rosters. And in terms of the Bledsoe man hierarchy, I probably lean Bledsoe just because he's starting, seems more willing to actually take shots. But they both should be on rosters. And based on some of the guys that everybody picked up prematurely the last two days, I think you guys have some drops you can make. Folks, please do drop a five-star review on the podcast and follow me on Twitter at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S, or just Google search Dan from HoopBall. It's the easiest way to find me. If you want to write something nice about the pod, that's fine also. You don't have to. All we really need is that five-star review. Go to the podcast app on the mobile device, if you're using an Apple one, I guess, or open up iTunes. Either way, search for Fantasy NBA Today. Click on the name of the show and the big show logo, not an episode name. 
If you're on a mobile device, scroll down to the bottom, rate and review there. If you're on iTunes, click on the rate and review tab and handle it that way. Thank you so much in advance. And of course, I will also see you all on Twitter. I'm hoping where you guys can tell me you're interested in working with us here at HoopBall. We need DFS writers, full season fantasy analysts, and if you want to cover a team on a podcast, hit me up at Dan Vespers on Twitter or email teamhoopball at hoop-ball.com. Tonight, Friday evening, we're back into a larger cardigan after yesterday. Ha, <laughs> cardigan. After yesterday's three-gamer. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to try to use the words card and again in rapid succession many times this season, and I'm going to chuckle at the word cardigan every single time. Indiana is in Washington with Bradley Beal questionable. We learned a little bit about the Pacers. Would not be at all surprised to see Chris Duarte have a total stinker in this ballgame on that Indiana side. Otherwise, without Beal, we don't learn quite as much about Washington as we really wanted to. And so you might have to just take what you find in this game and shelve it a little bit. Knicks in Orlando after that crazy first one. This this has letdown written all over it for the Knicks. I think we'll see Kemba slowly settle in with that team. You'll certainly see Fournier not play quite as well as he did in game one, but uh, we'd, I think we'd have a pretty good feel for what's going on in New York even after one ball game. With Orlando, not quite as strong of a feel. Right now, it seemed like Mo Bamba might be the only fantasy player on that club at this exact moment. Chumo Kiki, when he gets back, could be inside the top 100, probably worth a look just because of how bad they looked in their last ball game. Not a big Wendell Carter Jr. fan here on the pod. You guys know that about me. And then Jonathan Isaac, oh my goodness, when he gets healthy, not only is he going to get to do all the defensive stuff he's been known for, but we haven't seen him with no usage guys left he didn't play remember last year when the magic shipped off vooch gordon fournier and the list goes on and on and on he'll have shots now on top of everything else oh boy can't wait till he gets back that's gonna be that's gonna be something special we don't really know when that is sadly charlotte and cleveland um uh... I think Cleveland is probably your spot to keep an eye on, although game one gave us a really good indicator of what that team's going to do. Ricky Rubio is probably the guy you're most curious about. And with Charlotte, Plumlee, P.J. Washington stuff. Cleveland's a relatively big team also, so you might see them go to Plumlee again. Brooklyn, Philadelphia, no Ben Simmons, so Tyrese Maxey should have another good ball game. Matisse Theibel should be able to find his way to four or more defensive stats. I like that. With Brooklyn, Nick Claxton played 24 minutes in that first game. He'll get eaten by Joel Embiid in this ballgame and Andre Drummond. So we'll see what Brooklyn does. They might not have any choice but to play a pretty big front court. LaMarcus Aldridge can do a little rumbling if they needed to, but that's probably your area of interest on the Nets. Toronto got blown out. Love to see them competitive here with the Celtics so we can get a better feel for what they're going to do with Scotty Barnes. Seemed like he's going to have a pretty big role, but is he going to have enough usage? I would say yes, he belongs on rosters. Gary Trent Jr., they paid him, but they didn't use him very much in that first ball game, so we'll see what the hell that's all about. Uh, Chris Boucher, do his minutes trend up as he works his way back from injury? I would assume so. Boston... Um, think Big Al's still out, so I guess you could stream Grant Williams if you really wanted to, but not super interested in that either. New Orleans is in Chicago. We have a pretty good idea what's going on with the Bulls at this point. Pelicans are a fatty question mark with no Josh Hart now either. Nikhil Alexander-Walker should get a bunch of shots if he misses a bunch of them here. Don't be too surprised. Jonas Valanciunas, I think, will have more fun at least dealing with Vooch than he did Embiid, even though... Pretty, two pretty tough centers for JV to start against. Uh, JV's going to have a great year based on the fact that he just was involved a lot. And Ingram's going to have to do a ton also. Thunder, Houston. Here we go. <laughs> Houston's favored by three and a half in this ballgame. This, this probably should be a homework game, but God help us, I don't know if we can really watch it live because these are some bad basketball teams. I want to know what Houston's going to do 
with guys like Jay Sean Tate, who didn't play that many minutes in the first game. I think he'll do more in this one. Is Daniel Tice actually going to get starters minutes, or is that straight, you know, 20 to 24 minutes a game and more of a placeholder type of thing? Like, why did they give that dude a multi-year contract? What was the point? And then Oklahoma City, everybody wants Josh Giddy to just take off, but it's going to take time for these guys. Overall, that club is just jammed with inefficient basketball players. Notable for no reason at all, because they're just super young. Pretty easy call to make. Yuck. No, I can't do that to you guys. Don't watch that game. It's, it's ugly. San Antonio at Denver. Can Will Barton follow it up? What are the Spurs this year beyond the main three, Murray, White, and Pirtle? We saw Lonnie Walker, Devin Vassell. Those guys had good ball games, but is that repeatable in lower minutes off the bench? I doubt it. Maybe twice, but not long term. Utah, nothing. Sacramento, nothing, really. Those two teams are pretty easy. And then Phoenix, not a whole lot. And the Lakers, not a whole lot. It's a weird start to the year. I'm, I don't want to say surprised, but I do think that every year there are fewer giant first week surprises just because we do so much research just as an entire fantasy community getting ready for draft day. Like we look at every player on every team to try to figure out if there's any avenue for that player to get into a lineup enough to make some sort of difference. The name that's I, I think is probably surprising people the most so far, maybe Ricky Rubio? The Cavs did say he was going to have a role with the team, but I don't know how many folks actually bought it. Brew had him relatively high, so I guess Aaron was on top. A couple guys did, I think. Forget who had it over at Edge. Uh, Bledsoe is somewhat surprising yesterday as well, him getting as much as he got to do, but uh, like... Even a couple years ago, you were talking about Devontae Graham just stepping in and playing like 35 minutes a game for the Hornets, and nobody saw that coming. Everybody kind of saw everything coming this year. Plus the sample size stuff. When things level off, we'll, we'll really know if anything happening right now was fully real. It does seem like Bledsoe is fairly real. I don't know about Rubio. 25 minutes, that's tough to do what he did every single ball game in only 25 minutes. But you never know. We'll get him running a little bit. Sure helps if you can throw a lob to Jared Allen going 11 for 11. <laughs> all right, that's about it, folks. This show is all of our shows brought to you by our good friends at manscaped.com. Check out the lawnmower 4.0. Trim yourself. And use coupon code HOOPBALL20 for 20% off and free shipping on your order at manscaped.com. Manscaped, guys, I'm still waiting for a free pair of boxers. That's the one piece of swag they haven't sent me so far. I want them Manscaped boxers. They look sweet. They look sleek. You can check those out. Again, manscaped.com, the website, coupon code HOOPBALL20. 20% off and free shipping on your order with our buddies over there. Check them out. Go get something now. Tomorrow, we'll do it again. It's a Saturday. I know. Special show. Weekend shows right now. That'll be show 23 in 23 days and we'll break down what we learned from this friday card i don't know if i gave you guys sufficient homework mm -mm -mm. what's the homework game i want you watching toronto that's a homework game and i want you watching if beal doesn't play it would have been washington but i don't think beal is going so it's it's toronto maybe San Antonio and maybe Cleveland or Orlando. Ah, geez, that's rough. All right, we'll go Toronto. Toronto's your homework for tonight. I'll grade your papers tomorrow. I'm Dan Vespers for Hoopball, the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Back at you Saturday morning. So long, everybody. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.